Well, top of the morning. It's great to be back. It's been a few weeks now, four weeks. I decided to take the four weeks and really enjoy family. I had a lot of work to do coming into December, ending the year with a lot of the clients that I do work for and uh, making sure my company wasn't ringing me <laughs> to give out. I like to be ahead and uh, and doing that and also preparing for the greatest time of the year which was Christmas. I had probably this year the best Christmas I've ever had. I had so much fun with family, no drama and uh, it's just been a great blessing and just spending lots of family time and quality time. I watched a lot of Christmas movies to be honest. I've watched a good few uh, old, basically 80s movies. I love all the movies from the 80s, The Flight, The Navigator, all that kind of stuff. I had a great time. and uh, But it's just great to be back and to encourage as many as I can. And uh, I hope that your Christmas has been a great one. And to all of you who have struggled through this Christmas because of the loss of loved ones, or maybe you've got children who are astray, my heart really does go out to you and I want to tell you that you know I feel it and um, I lived on the streets for so many years and I always see my mother looking out that window in my mind sometimes when I think of her even now as I get older wondering where her son was and as a young man I just didn't care about anybody because I felt nobody cared about me but someone cares someone always cares and the most important thing that you will ever understand about Jesus is that he constantly cares about you. He is in constant, he's constantly thinking. He cares about you and he has a great love for you. So whatever situation you're going through, whether you're going up, you're up there or you're down here, wherever you are, I just want you to know that God loves you. And uh, it's just a great blessing to be back and to share. And uh, I'm just really privileged. The amount of people who are responding to the message of grace. Yes, there are some who are negative and are trying to entrap, I suppose, but <laughs> I'll try not to think about that. There are as always people who, you know, haven't got great things to say. But for me, I'm not getting into an argument and a debate with anybody. And if you've come to understand the message of the gospel of grace, allow that to permeate into every fibre of your being and to totally be assured of the goodness of God in your life, to be totally assured of the grace of God and his great love for you. When you are assured of that, that there's never going to be an abandonment. He's never going to reject me. You know, this isn't about the special elect that God has chosen a special few who have all the answers and, you know, we are the apostles and the prophets of today. Nonsense. God can speak to any one of us. I'm not an intellectual person at all. I like to read now, but I wouldn't call myself, I don't go around calling myself anything, you know. I'm too busy. <laughs> I'm too busy to call myself anything. I'm a father and I'm a husband. And um, and uh, I just really want to uh, tell people about the love of God. And basically I'm sharing my journey really. And as I begin to sit and read scriptures and as things unfold for me and I begin to see, you know, Jesus for who he truly is, because the revelation of Jesus is always growing in our hearts. He's not a theology, you know. Some people think that because they have all the theology set down, and then if you don't go by that, they're going to step in and put you out, you know. It's like nonsense. Keep away from people like that, you know. The the love of God far outweighs any doctrine. You know, I see people writing about, you know, if you love God, you'd love doctrine, and if you love God, you'd be studying and I don't listen to people like that. I read the word of God. But I allow the Holy Spirit just to talk to me and minister to me. And uh, because, you know, there's times in my day and times in my life where um, I I don't doubt God. But things go on in my head that you wouldn't believe. And I'm sure things are going on in some user heads. And that's okay. But it's important to just sit down and to remind ourselves of why. God loves us and what he has done to show us this love and then to show what kind of love he has brought us into and I hope that I can in some way 
and spoil that in your hearts as we go along in these videos. So without further ado, I'm going to read from Colossians chapter 1. I'll probably be reading some verses today. And uh, again, this is something I've really, been, it's been exploding in my spirit in a sense. And um, there's a part of me that just wants to keep calm. And then there's a part of me that wants to jump up and down. But I want to kind of read the scriptures and try to help us to think one of things, one or two things true. And uh, hopefully this will get somewhere and uh, you will be have clarity of mind on what I'm trying to say. And uh, I understand what I want to say, but whether I can say it with clarity, I'll leave that to the audience. <laughs> so let's read from Colossians chapter 1. And I'm going to start with verse 25. This is the Apostle Paul speaking, and he says this, Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God, bestowed on me for your benefit. Paul is saying, I've received uh, this ministry as a minister according to the stewardship of God. God has given me this, this ministry to speak to you, and it's for your benefit that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations. But has now been manifested to his saints. To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Which is Christ in you the hope of glory this mystery of christ in you the hope of glory i absolutely adore the apostle paul and uh, i try to spend a bit of time when i'm reading his writings i try to just think about him as an individual and i think about his past life and i try to put it all together so then when i read when i see him making statements i see how how powerful they are and uh, it's only when we understand a lot about him that when you make certain phrases or comments and you it, it click, you know, you catch it, you know, it's like, whoa, I'll get that, and it explodes. But the Apostle Paul, even when you would see the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, I think it's chapter 16, I'm not quite sure, where he's on Mars Hill, and there's there's loads of gods, they worship all of these pagan gods, and um, but there's one god called the Unknown God, and the Apostle Paul was so clever, so he decides to take up this statue of the Unknown God, and he begins to proclaim the gospel. And uh, he starts preaching about Jesus Christ, the unknown God. And he makes Jesus known to the world, well, to the people of Mars Hill, where all the great minds would probably gather, and all the local people as well, obviously. But Paul was a genius at taking the things that the Greeks understood, and he would use these phrases. And so basically Paul does this again, when he's writing to the Colossian church. And he says he uses the word mystery. The mystery of God. The mystery of his will. And mystery was a really a word that was well known among the Greeks. Because there used to be what they called the rite of Eleusius. I think it was called. And basically they worshipped two kinds of God. I think it was Demeter and Phosphor. I think I wrote down the name here. Yeah, Persephone and Demeter. And basically, they were gods, basically, of agriculture. You basically pray to these gods. Not many people know a lot about the rite of Eleusis. Because you had to be basically initiated into this cult or into this group. A lot of the ancient Greeks were basically initiated. And still to this day, an awful lot of stuff that they actually did believe. And what the mysteries were inside of this uh, pagan uh, fellowship are still not known today. But whatever it did, it did, it did change the people who were basically initiated because from what I understand, a lot of stuff basically was revealed to them about the God of the agriculture, but also a lot about immortality. And so basically they understood that there was life after death and this kind of whole thing of having life after death had an amazing effect upon uh, these Greeks who were actually part of this rite. And so Paul uses this word, basically the mystery, the mystery 
of God's will. So it pleased God. Paul actually said it pleased God to make known the riches of his glory among the Gentiles. And Paul is basically saying that God has revealed to me a ministry. He has shown me that there is a message that I must actually share with this whole world. And it's had such a massive effect upon my life that I can do nothing but share it. And so salvation, you see, was not just now in Paul's eyes for the Jews. But the mystery of God's will, the mystery of God's will was to bring Jew and Gentile together. Now that's an amazing thing for Paul to come to the conclusion of because he was a Pharisee. He hated the Gentiles. They were considered as dogs. So basically, Paul's whole life is totally upended by the revelation of Jesus Christ. That all of a sudden, he now sees these people, the sons of men, as basically, you know, people who are loved by the Father of Heaven, Jesus Christ, who is now in him, the hope of glory. So this hope of glory that was in Paul, he realises that God has also revealed to him that this is not just about Jewish people. That this was never, ever really about Jewish people. Yes, the mystery of this has been hidden from past aid, past aid, in the past days. But now through his holy apostles and his prophets, it has been revealed the mystery of his will. So basically what he's saying is, this mystery that has been hidden for so long, it's not a mystery anymore. <laughs> it's the mystery that God so loved the world that he has come to live and to reside in you and in me. That is powerful. Paul is saying this is not something that's external. Look, I was faultless according to the law of righteousness. I thought I was perfect. But when I saw Jesus, when I beheld Jesus, he saw and helped me to see that there was no good thing in me in old Saul. And so Paul was born of the Spirit. And the revelation of who God was came into Paul's heart. Christ came in to Paul's life. Radically changed his life. Brought him out into a desert. And ministered to him. Where he receives revelation of the Holy Spirit. About this gospel. And then he comes storming out of the desert. To shake the world. That was Paul. And he came to shake the world. And so Paul is talking about this mystery that was hidden from ages. But it's not a mystery anymore. That God loved all of mankind. That God loved the Gentile. And God loved the Jew. And God loved everyone in between. <laughs> if, that, if there is everyone in between. But listen. This was the message of God. This was a message of God to Paul. But it wasn't just only a message that was given to Paul. The message was in Paul. The message was Paul himself. Because God had absolutely transformed and changed this man from a killer to a person with a message of love for the world. That God so loved the world. That Christ came to redeem and that God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world to himself. Not counting our sins against us. Thank God for that. But it was Jesus. The message of Jesus. Christ in us. The hope of glory. Let's just read verse 25 for a moment. When he says this. Of this church I was made a minister. According to the stewardship from God. Bestowed on me. For your benefit. That I might carry out. The preaching of the word of God. You know it's so easy. Just to read over. What Paul is just saying. When I read that I see an ecstatic man. I see a man who's so overwhelmed. By the fact that he's chose me. God has chosen me. Me. To preach the gospel. Why would he choose someone like me? How could God choose a man. Who went around. You know locking people up. Who are part of the church. Standing there. While they were stoning Stephen to death. Standing there while they were stoning so many others to death. Watching them being whipped. Watching them being beaten. Standing probably next to the children with a grin. As their mothers and fathers were being slaughtered and stoned to death and whipped to death. Because of a love and a profession of Jesus Christ. How could God choose me? But he did. And Paul is saying because he's chosen me. I am willing. I'm in chains but I'm willing 
to let them beat me. And I'm willing. I saw what they did to them. I saw what they did to those Christians. I stood there and gave my command to it. And I gave my word to it. Yes, do it. I stood there and watched these people go to their deaths, go to prison, take all this punishment for a God in heaven who I didn't believe in. A God called Jesus Christ who I didn't believe in. And yet Jesus has revealed himself to me. Why did God reveal himself to me? But when Paul, he, he realizes because God loved the world and he takes the worst of us to reach the worst of us. <laughs> God so loved he loved Paul realized this is a God of love how could a God love me I murdered people I locked people up in prison I stood there watching them being beaten this man was ecstatic this man lived in celebration I think every time he whipped he, he took a whip every time he took a stone he was just Christ centered he could, he could only see one thing and it was Christ and him crucified Christ and him resurrected and he could also see himself seated now with that Christ in heavenly places you can whip me you can beat me you can torture me but you'll never get this out of me that's in me the love of God and this was the very thing that Paul says compels me I'm compelled to tell people about this Jesus I'm compelled to tell people about the love of God this Christ that is in me the hope of glory I want to read in Ephesians chapter 3. We turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Actually, I think I have a row here. Ephesians chapter 3. This is what Paul says. And by revelation, there was made known to me, as I wrote before in brief, and by referring to this, when you read, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men so again he's saying it he wrote it to the Ephesians as well he's saying this had not been made known to the sons of men it was meant the sons of men were blinded to this mystery that God so loved the world and he says it was not made known to the sons of men as it has been now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit to be specific that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. You can see Paul. I am glad to announce to you today. I am glad with great joy and proclamation. That God has taken all those I consider to be dogs. All those heathen. All those pagan people. Who I believe who are worshipping foreign gods. Who have been saving all of these false gods. I am glad to announce to you today. <laughs> That God has come not just for the Jew, but he's come for the Gentile as well. And he realizes that the true Israel has nothing got to do with Israel itself as a place. The true Israel were people who were born of the Spirit. They were born of the Spirit. The same people who God talked about when he gave the promise to Abraham. I am going to make you the father of many nations. Abraham was their father. I'm a Gentile. Anyone that's not Jewish by birth is basically a Gentile. And yet we get to declare Abraham from the Old Testament as our father. Because we are the children of faith. We have seen through the eyes of faith who God truly is by sending a son, God becoming a man, reconciling the world through the cross by shedding his blood, revealing his absolute love for mankind. Do your worst. Do what you need to do to me. And every ounce of my blood is going to scream out forgiven and love to every man and woman who beholds me in my crucifixion, who beholds me in my burial, who beholds me in my resurrection. I love the world and I'm willing to do whatever. This message was birthed in Paul. It was born in Paul. He understood what it was for the Gentiles to receive this message as well. And the more I begin to dig into the Apostle Paul's mind, the more the gospel and the more the books of Paul, the letters of Paul are exploding on the page to me. And they will to you that God loved the world. He loves you and he loves me. He's always loved us. Paul is saying this has surely blown my mind that the God of heaven and earth has revealed the mystery to me and in me. Not just to me, but in me. 
This is not just a message that we just speak, God loves the world. No, this message is actually me. Because God has commanded his light to shine into darkness. To bring the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God has commanded his light to shine in me. God has commanded his light to shine in you. Because out of darkness his light has shone. His light has shone out of darkness. His light has come. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God. What is the knowledge of the glory of God? What is the, what is the glory of God? Most people, you know, we don't really ask that question. What is the glory of God? You can pull down a few books from here. And you can read lots of stuff about what God's glory is. I want to just share a little bit about what I believe the glory of God is. And I really want you to listen. I want you to hear what I want to say. Because this for me is what the glory of God is. And this for me is the reason why I share these messages. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 33. In Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. I'm going to read a few verses. And uh, if you look at verse. Verse. We'll turn to. Verse 12. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, thou dost say to me, Bring up this people, but thou thyself hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Moreover, thou hast said, I have known you by name, and you have also found favour in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found favour in thy sight, let me know thy ways. So here's Moses asking God, Look, if I found favour with you, show me your ways. God hadn't truly revealed himself fully because the children had been in Israel or in uh, uh, Egypt for 400 years they had taken all of these pagan practices and God had called this man who was in the wilderness for 40 years and he called this man and Moses he begins this I know God I know you exist I know you've called me I've seen your power I've seen what you did amongst the Egyptians and now he's saying look at God show me your ways show me your ways I want to go on verse 2 verse 16 for how then can it be known that I have found favour in thy sight I and thy people it is not by thy going with us so that we and I and thy people may be distinguished from all other people who are upon the earth and the Lord said to Moses I will I will also do this thing of which you have spoken for you have found favour in my sight and I have known you by name in the verses just before that he actually talks about Lord Joe, I'm not, I can't go anywhere unless your presence goes with me. So Moses, he didn't want to go anywhere without the presence of God. And he goes on to say then in verse 18, Then Moses said, I pray thee, Lord, show me thy glory. This is Moses and he says, show me thy glory. Show me your glory. And this is what he said. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion but he said you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live and then the Lord said behold there is a place by me and you should stand there on the rock and it will come about well my glory is passing boy that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed boy then I will take my hand away and you shall see my back but my face you shall not see I see I heard so many preachers you know even today they love preaching on Moses and uh, even in prayer times you'll hear a lot of people you know when it talks about Moses saying Lord I do not let me go before you. Let your presence come with me. There are still people praying that prayer today. You know what they haven't had the revelation of in their heart truly. They don't understand the new covenant of God. They don't understand that when the Holy Spirit came into our life. That is the presence of God that is fully with us. God in Christ Jesus was reconciling the world to himself. And when he reconciled us and when we came into union, into relationship with him, 
when he revealed who he was to our hearts and our hearts responded <laughs> to this amazing love and we confessed and we believed and we entered into fellowship and union with the Father. We Not only did we go, come into him, but he came into us. And that's why the apostle says we live and move and have our being in Christ Jesus. Where you go, he goes. When you get up in the morning, he's there. When you get into the car, he's there. When you drive down to the church building, he's there. When you go to work, he's there. The presence of God is with us 24-7. This nonsense of saying, Lord, we cannot go anywhere unless your presence comes with us. It sounds very holy because you're reading it from the Bible, but it's not true. But it's also all, when you read what Moses actually says, he uses a phrase that is used by the Apostle Paul in Romans 9. He says this, that Moses said, I pray thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. So God is saying, all my goodness is going to pass before you. And he says this, and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. Now the Apostle Paul uses this actual phrase in Romans chapter 9. And so many of the church have taken that phrase to believe that God has selected only certain people for salvation. And God hasn't selected some for heaven and some for hell. It's now God's will that any would perish but that all would come to eternal life. And so God has offered, he offered himself to all mankind. When he was lifted up on that cross, it was for all mankind. And so God wants all to believe in what he has truly done for them. He wants them to understand this is not about you turning or burning. This is about you understanding that before the fall in that garden, when there was just me, the Father is saying, when it was just me and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, when we were in divine union together, we birthed you, we birthed mankind out of our being. And we have always loved mankind. And so he says to Moses, I will show compassion on whom I show compassion. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I don't really believe the full revelation of that reached in to the mind of Moses but Paul reminds the church of Jesus Christ as he's writing to the Romans of this same verse because now this mystery has not been hidden that I haven't just come just to reveal myself to a Jewish nation I have come to reveal myself to the world <laughs> the glory of God people say what's the glory of God look the, he talks about the goodness of God passing before Moses. Now just think for a moment. The, all the goodness of God will pass before Moses. And so God puts his, you know, puts him in a rock. And all of a sudden, you know, he sees the back of God. You know, the Bible tells us that God is love. That's what he is. He is divine love. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Love. When Moses saw the back of God, he was looking in to the he was looking into the back of the vine burning love. Because that's exactly what we were birthed out of. Pure divine love. This message of the gospel has been about a divine romance. That God has been constantly, it's been hidden. It was hidden from so many. But God, when you begin to look at the scriptures, you begin to see from the beginning to the end that he was putting something together because he has wanted to always come to dwell in man. That has always been his longing in their heart, the Father, Son and Spirit, that we would be in them and they would be in us. That has been the mystery. You want to know what the glory of God is? People are looking for this special anointing and special this. The glory of God is the love of God. It's the divine love of God. Jesus Christ was all the goodness of God personified, walking about the earth, doing good, healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing lepers, casting out devils. He was constantly doing good because he was the personification of his father. And love was the very motive of of the ministry of Jesus. Love was the very motive of the Father sending Jesus, God taking on flesh, becoming a man and coming into the world to reveal himself to the world. 
all the goodness of God dwelt in Jesus Christ. All the goodness. And all the goodness of God was the love of God. It was the love of God. And the love of God was the glory of God. Because the mystery of His will was the hope of glory. The hope of glory, which was what? Christ in us. Let me read a verse, a few verses from John chapter 17. I want you to sit and just think about these verses. And uh, you may not come to believe what I believe about one or two verses here. But I'm going to share them the best way I can with you. And we'll see what the glory of God was. Jesus is actually praying to his Father. It's called the High Priestly Prayer. A lot of people call the Our Father the Lord's Prayer. But that was the disciples' prayer. He was teaching them how to pray under the Old Covenant. Because they were under an Old Covenant. But here Jesus is praying the real Lord's Prayer in John 17. And if you look in verse 22, they listen to what it says. And the glory which thou hast given me. Now listen, Jesus hasn't died yet. He hasn't gone to the cross. He hasn't been buried. And he hasn't been resurrected. So really listen intently. And the glory which thou hast given me, I have given to them. Now, there has been no resurrection, there has been no, but he says, the glory that thou hast given me, I have given to these disciples, I have given it to them. And then he says this, I and them, and thou and me, that they may be perfected in unity, that the world may know that thou didst send me, and didst love them, even as thou loves me. So Jesus is saying basically. I am revealed to them. That you have always loved me. And I have always loved you. And he said. Thou didst send me and thou didst love them. But I've also loved you. loved them father. You sent me because you loved them. And you loved me. And I've given them that message. I've given them. And I've shown them. I've personified exactly what you've wanted me. All the goodness of God that was dwelling in me. All the love that we are. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Everything. I've, I've, I've shown them exactly who you are. I've shown them what you're about. I've shown them what love does. I've shown them what love is. It's the reality of the Father living in me. And so Jesus said, I'm giving, I gave them this love. Listen to what he says. Father, I desire that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. Now where was Jesus? He's right there in the garden. He hadn't died yet. He hadn't been resurrected from the dead. And he's basically saying, Father, I desire that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. In order. Why? Where does he want them to be where he is? Where is Jesus? Jesus is in constant fellowship with his Father. He's in union with God. He is part of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He wasn't not in relationship with God. Jesus, his mind was in another world. His mind wasn't based on the physical. You know, the transfiguration many years ago, I remember I was really struggling with so much in life. And I think I was in Italy with the wife and the children. And I remember reading the transfiguration every morning. And I was getting really browned off reading it. But I really felt I needed to read it. And then one day it just dawned on me that when Jesus is seen speaking by the disciples with Moses and Elijah, I realized that that was probably one of the reasons Jesus never brought them to pray with him. Because the disciples came to him and said, teach us how to pray. <laughs> Will you show us how to pray? Because they saw something in that transfiguration. This was like the appetizer to what really was about to happen for them. And he's basically showing, I'm, I'm in union, I'm in fellowship. I'm talking with things, with unknown things. Things that you could never understand. I basically, Jesus probably didn't want them to come into that prayer, prayer room with him. Because they wouldn't be able for it. But Jesus is talking there to Moses and Elijah. That's the power of the unseen world. That was the fellowship that Jesus was having with the Father. You don't have to agree with that. 
you don't have to believe that that's what i see and jesus is saying here right now and he says it here he says father i desire that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where i am in order that they may behold my glory now listen which thou hast given me and what's that glory for thou didst love me before the foundation of the world jesus is saying we love each other father i know you it's i i understand that we were in fellowship you loved me i loved you and the holy spirit we were in divine fellowship now let that glory be in them <laughs> let them know that glory where i am living where i am basking as an earthly man when they are when i'm gone from this earth may they also know the power of this unseen world may they know this glory this hope this love that is in me may this be in them this divine love <laughs> this was the glory of god the glory of god was the love of god the love of god for mankind the love of god for people the love of god when we look in society and we see the pain and the agony and the brokenness of so many people's lives we get the chance to exude this love to show this love to a lost and broken dying world the personification of all the goodness of god is not just resting and abiding in jesus who is up in heaven seated at the right hand side of the father the personification of all the goodness of god resides in me and you the personification of the glory of god the love of god god himself resides in me and in you let me just read on he says my he says thou hast given me oh father i deserve that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, in order that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou didst love me before the foundations of the world. And he says this, O righteous Father, although the world has not known thee, the world has not known them. He's saying this, they haven't truly known who you are. They don't understand that you are a God of love. They don't understand how much you love not just Jews but Gentiles as well. That your love has always been for the whole world. He says, O righteous Father, although the world has not known thee, yet I have known thee. And these have known that thou didst send me. So he knows that these people know, that these disciples know that you sent me. And then he says this, And I have made your name known to them. How did Jesus make the Father's name known to the disciples? He lived a life of love. He lived a life of love. He exuded love to the disciples. This was Jesus. Fully God, yet fully man. Our representative. And he was fully loved. He knew he was loved. And he knew how much God loved the world and so his ministry the ministry by the power of the holy spirit he was able to see the world for what it was and see mankind for what it was and he never passed judgment on man he never passed judgment on the weak he never on the religious yes but when he saw man and all of its brokenness he was moved with compassion moved with the glory of the love of god that was instilled in him through divine union and fellowship and he was moved to heal and moved to love all those he came into contact with and i have made thy name known to them and will make it known and he says this that the love wherewith thou didst love me may be in them and i in them you know god when people talk about the glory of god and they use moses as an example moses longs or longed to one i bet you he longed to one he probably looks at us and thinks what the hell do you just not realize what has happened when you just got born again if only i had known that we look at moses and we lift him up on a pedestal we look at David and we look for Elijah and calling down fire and Samson and all these great old apostles of all, or, you know, great men of old who done great things. When the Holy Spirit would come on them and cause them to do great exploits. And yet Jesus comes 
by the power of the Holy Spirit to live in each and every one of our lives. You want to know what glory is? The glory of God is the divine love of God. The divine love of God so moved Paul that he was compelled to give his life. And he did give his life. Eventually he died in a prison cell. But even when you look at him in that cell with, with Silas and himself and he's chained there, it would have been smelly, probably feces and wee and people and crying down in that dungeon. He probably said to Silas, Silas, sing us a song there. And, <laughs> and the two of them began to sing. And they began to sing about this wonderful Jesus. They didn't see chains. They didn't see a prison cell. They were awestruck. They were awestruck by the message of this glory of Christ in them, which was the hope of glory. This glory was alive and living in them, and it was God himself. Moses had to hide himself in the cleft of the rock. But we have this treasure. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has now shone in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That loving, beautiful face, Jesus. God personified in man. God exalted in a man. Jesus filled with all the fullness of God. And what is God and who is God? God is love. And yet he says that we have been given the fullness of God, that we are the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God has come to live in us. You know, God wants us to grow in our understanding of how much he loves us. As we awaken to how much he loves us, what happens is we begin to love as he loved. The glory of God is not some great exploits and some great moment. All oh, the glory was there or the glory was here. Just like Peter and James and John up on that mountain. Oh, shall we build an altar? That's what they've done with revivals through the years, building altars and making those places holy grounds. When we ourselves were the holy ground. We ourselves is the place where the glory of God resides. Love resides. This is power. The power of God is the love of God. The love of God is the glory of God. And the glory of God is in us. And we get the opportunity to grow in love. To grow in the grace of God. And as we begin to know how much we're loved, you know we can learn to love. This world what we know of love of this world is eros love or stoich love or filial love. It's nothing compared to the agape love. The glory of God is the glory of his love. His love is glorious. That is, it's powerful because love is God and God himself is love. God bless you. I hope this in some way has encouraged you. You know, there was times I wanted to jump out of chat, but um, I didn't. And uh, I'm just, I just want you to know that you are loved by God. And not just loved, but love resides in you. And love longs for fellowship with you. He just wants to tell you how much he loves you so much. Every day when you wake up, he just wants to tell you he loves you. When you're going through difficulty, I want you to know I love you. When you fail, I just need you to know I love you. When you sin... I just want you to know I love you because he loves and he's got our back and he will bring us through to the end because love never fails. God bless you and I'll see you again next week. Bye bye.